thank you for joining us for the 2023 Action for Impact Summit. I am Felicity Hassan, co-founder of The Find, uh, which is an executive search firm dedicated to building representative leadership. I'm also a very proud board member of the WBC. So now let me introduce and welcome our awardee. Known as one of the preeminent global leaders on the current state and future of employment culture and leadership, Johnny has been a trailblazer his entire professional career. Currently the president and CEO of SHRM, he's been responsible for growing its membership by more than 300,000 in 165 countries and impacting the lives of more than 235 million workers and families around the world. His commitment to public service includes serving as chairman of the President's Advisory Board on Historically Black Colleges and Universities and serving as a member of the White House American Workforce Poly Policy Advisory Board during the Trump administration. Johnny, it's clear to all of us that you've been a, lot, a formidable voice for transformative change. So it's my honor on behalf of the Women Business Collaborative to present you with the 2023 WBC Trailblazer in Gender Equity and Diversity Award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And I got to tell you, I am personally so proud of this award. I had to bring it from my office over to this, this session today so I could show you how important it is to me. And as we get into our conversation, I'll tell you why. But the short of it is, I have a working mother, I have two sisters, and I'm the proudest dad of a 13-year-old little girl. And so it is like a big deal to me because I'm hoping that the world of work is even better for my baby as she matures and comes into industry. Johnny, even before you took over as CEO of Oshem, you've been considered a global leader on looking at the future of the workforce and community. Yes. In fact, you recently were named by Washingtonian Magazine as one of Washington, D.C.'s most influential people shaping public policy, which is amazing. Uh, as we continue our reemergence from the pandemic, how would you categorize characterize the current state of the workforce and what are some of the lasting changes to it that are causing communities to adapt and change as part of the great reset? Gosh, I tell you, uh, what hasn't changed in the workforce <laughs> over the last three years uh, between the pandemic, the moment, the racial reckoning that our country dealt with post George Floyd's uh, death, horrific death, there's a lot that has occurred in the last three years. But if I were to kind of sit back and reflect on how it's changed in the state of the workforce, there are a couple of things that come to mind. One, which will surprise you a little bit, is we are in an environment where our country is as really as diverse as it's ever been, which is a phenomenal thing, and it's becoming more diverse. One only has to look right now at America's K through 12 public school systems and know that the diversity is coming. In fact, it's going to be really hard to lack diversity in your organization 20 years from now, unless you are going out of your way to not have representation because just birthright, right? The, the demographics are what they are. And that's going to lead to a very, very interesting dynamic for those people who think, and I see all of the headlines every day about, you know, diversity is overplayed and we're over it, et cetera. I think they're wrong. In fact, now more than ever, as our workforce, and this is globally, by the way, I just left Paris meeting with a group of the 40 largest companies in the country in France discussing this issue. America is going to have more women in leadership roles. It's going to have more people of color, underrepresented people. I mean, it's going to be more and more diverse. And the one area that I'd like to really focus on for just a second is America is going to have to, and the globe is going to have to get comfortable with older workers. If there's one thing that is driving a shift in a way that we've never seen before is people are living longer and they're working longer, even when they don't have to financially, they're doing it because work is about dignity. And, you know, back in the day when the average American in our case died at 65 or 66, of course, people wanted to retire so that they can enjoy some part of their life without going to work. Well, now that people are living longer, they want to work longer. And that's what we're seeing. So for the first time ever in our history, we have five generations in the workforce at once. 
And that has created a very, very interesting issue. So the workplace is more diverse. The question is, is it inclusive? And that's the biggest thing that we are now, and I know you're nodding because this is what you do for a living. Diversity is always important, but inclusion, I would submit to you, we are learning is the bigger challenge, is the more formidable challenge that we have to face. We have organizations right now that are incredibly diverse. They have the representation, but the people don't feel like they're seen, they're heard, that they are included and or they belong. So you're hearing a lot of that. In the last decade, particularly, there's been a growing urgency around implementing programs around DEI, and organizations of all shapes and sizes are hiring individuals to lead and implement DEI programs. And we've seen that shift yes. over the course of the last couple of months as well. Uh, where do you think this impotence for inclusion programs originated? Because we've talked about the importance of inclusion. And what was the shift that allowed the C-suite to see what they had been missing? Right. I, I think it, it it came out of, we sort of got to this point, and it was actually pre-pandemic and pre-George Floyd uh, murder, where it became clear that the country was going to be more diverse, like it or not, right? And so we said, we have these organizations where we and HR will take surveys, employee engagement surveys, and we find organizations that were very diverse, yet the engagement scores were down. People, when you measured them on a sense of belonging, inclusion, like, do I like my job? The scores were down. And we said, wait a minute. We naively thought for 30 years that if you got diversity right, representation, that would solve for everything. And it didn't. And people said, uh-oh, diversity is not enough. Surely you need diversity. But the holy grail is to achieve diversity and inclusion. People have to feel like they're included. And we started to reach that in the early 2010, 11 era. I started hearing people talk about, you got diversity, but I'm not sure everyone feels included. So I think that's where it started to come. And then it took on a life of its own post-George Floyd. I think we began to have discussions at the board level. So by the way, this wasn't just... HR or some diversity person trying to push this up into an organization that didn't have time for it, resisted it, what have you, they said, wow, we've got to do something about this. We have a significant number of women. We have a significant number of African-Americans, but no one's happy and they are turning. We're seeing them come and leave as fast as you can recruit them. They're going somewhere else. And so we started to really explore the conversation around inclusion. And George Floyd, as I said, un as unfortunate as his death was, what it did was it forced us to have a conversation about equity, inclusion. So, yeah, you have all of these black employees now, representation within your workforce, but no one knows how to talk with them about how they feel about George Floyd's death. None of us. And so that moment, and then it spread to issues of the LGBTQ community and to uh, different ethnicities. We often conflate race and ethnicity, and they are two different things, right? So we just, this whole thing started to evolve, and the board said, we've got to figure this out because we know that our country is going to be a majority minority country. And so if that's the case, we better figure out how to manage this diversity because the diversity is coming. Right. So that's what has led everyone to have these conversations at the leaders in Washington, D.C. are having this conversation. You know, we can't make assumptions about how black people vote and how women vote and for like everything that we have spent 30 or 40 years mastering has been turned on its head and it's forcing the entire society to grapple with how do we now manage this very wonderfully diverse country called America. How is SHRM helping employers work to eliminate the disparities that continue to affect women in the workplace? Yes. So first of all, it is one of the biggest issues of our time. As I mentioned, there are more women in the workforce increasingly and more women in the U.S. population than there are men over time, right? And so if we are not paying those women in equi equitably, then we are hurting our economy, we're hurting ourselves. It's just not in our best interest. So it's not even about one individual person, it is about society uh, doing the right thing and it's very economic at a core level. Good for our economy and therefore good for our country. Okay, so let me start with that. The problem is 
compensation is really, really complicated. And people think they overly simplify person A is in this job, person B is in this job, and they need to make the same money. And let me tell you, there are just too many factors that come into play from geography to experience to industry to there's just it, this this the desire to make something that is very, very complicated, simple, has actually harmed us. So what we, are we doing at SHRM? We're spending a significant amount of time and research educating people on all of the nuances that come with doing pay equity the right way. And ultimately, we agree on the goal. We do not want a woman working for less than a man in a comparable role, period, full stop. It's not right. And it's also happens to not be legal, right? So those things help, right? <laughs> but, but then, we, so we need tools to help us make sure that we're evaluating properly the roles, the job, the location, all of those things so that we pay people appropriately and equitably. When we, that's, that's the number one thing is we've got to get people to understand because people overly simplify a very complicated and nuanced area of human resources. Once we do that, give you the tools to do it, then we've got to work. And this is a big part of my work is we acquired a company called CEO Academy last year. We've got to get into the heads of the board leaders as well as the C-suite. And we've got to say, listen, You've got to fix this. This is like any other business imperative that if you don't fix this, the organization will fail. I mean, and that's what we're doing. I am using the bully pen of my office to say to CEOs, again, I think there's a moral argument here, but the reality is this is bad for business. Women are our consumers. And if they are paid more equitably, then they can spend more money on, on our products and our services, et cetera. So this is good for our economy to pay people what they should be paid. Finally, yes. and I'm sad it's finally, but finally, we've been asking all of our 2023 trailblazers, what is your call to action? on how we increase women's leadership across all sectors of business. Wow. Can you please share your call to action? We have got to have these conversations and we've got to continue having them. At the end of the day, I, I, this is very much about a campaign of keeping this in front of influencers. We, the, you can be lulled into believing that we've achieved uh, and we have achieved some major progress when, it, when it's come to gender in the workforce, but it's not enough. And I worry that there's a resting of the laurels, resting on your laurels of sorts that we've seen in corporate America right now. It's like, listen, women make up 10 percent of the Fortune 500 CEOs now. Wow. Haven't we done something? Yes. But women also make up 51 percent or so of the U.S. population. So there is still work to do. We must continue keeping this front and center with corporate leaders, government leaders, everyone to say there's still a significant gap from an opportunity standpoint. And whatever obstacles we can remove, uh, you know, whatever we need to do, if it's education, if it's reskilling, if it's pay, if it's belonging in the workforce, we have got to double down. Uh, take our victory lap. Yes, 10% is a big number. I am so proud that we now have 50 plus women in Fortune 500 CEO roles, but we've got a lot of work to do. And so my sort of rally right now is to say, recognize the progress, but push push, push, push the opportunity that remains on the, tail, on the table. And if we can figure that out, closing that gap, then we will absolutely be a much stronger country as a result of it and a society. Thank you so much. Congratulations again, Johnny. Uh, thank you for blazing trails and leading from government to philanthropic ventures to the education sector. Just thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really informative. Thank you. This is my honor to receive this most amazing award. So thank you again to WBC. And I appreciate everything that you do for this work because it is really important work. Thank you, Johnny.